Hello, and welcome to the ALSI podcast, where we share the stories of lung cancer patients and their caregivers, as well as the work of doctors and researchers in the field. Today, we have the great honor and privilege of having Dr. Moreland with us. Dr. Moreland is a healthcare information management content creator, public voices fellow of the op-ed project, speaker, and graduate professor, among many other roles. Through her experiences in ac academia and healthcare, Dr. Moreland has been working to develop solutions to address the socioeconomic factors influencing health outcomes. This includes those outcomes related to lung cancer, which Dr. Moreland has personal experience with as a caregiver to her mother, who was diagnosed with lung cancer. Dr. Moreland, we're so honored to have you on our podcast today, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited and nervous at the same time. <laughs> well, no need to be nervous. We're just honored to have you. And to introduce the moderators today, my name is Pranka Senthal. My name is Jacob Rashab. My name is Pranav Mandium. And I'm Sam Schwartz. And we are with the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative, a national 501c3 nonprofit working to raise awareness of lung cancer and lung cancer screening. To get started, Dr. Moreland, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. I think that she kind of covered uh, most of everything, but honestly, I'm just, um, the biggest thing that I want people to take away is that I'm here to try to um, address those socioeconomic issues that impact our health overall. I believe that uh, the key ways of doing that is through education, health literacy. Um, and I also like to use my background in health information management to see how I can kind of partner with organizations to kind of help fill fill the need. So I'm really excited to be able to share my experiences today. Thank you so much. And while you 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 mentioned um, health information management, could you explain what health information management professionals do? Yeah, absolutely. So HIM basically refers to anything dealing with uh, healthcare data, healthcare information. So this comes from um, patient insurance information, their uh, documentation, um, maybe the numbers uh, associated with their healthcare and managing that information, how it's being dispersed, how it's being used. So in a nutshell, that's what health information management is all about. How do we take the data, protect the data, and also disperse it and use it? Yeah. So, Dr. Moreland, as we mentioned earlier on, you're a caregiver or you were a caregiver for your mother who suffered from lung cancer. Could you tell us a little bit just about your mother? Yeah. So my mother, she let me see. She has such an interesting story. So she grew up in Jacksonville, Texas, which is um, in East Texas is a really small town. Um, she grew up there and she met my father when she was about 13 years old. And she married him at the age of 15. It's a really crazy story how that happened. But she had, of course, had my grandmother's permission. So they married at 15. And from there, my father came to Dallas. And once he got everything established, he brought her up to Dallas with him. Um, they got married. She started working. Um, and then about 10 years into their marriage, that's when I came along. Um, and then after that, you know, she just kind of... Uh, live life to the fullest as much as she could. Um, uh, she divorced shortly after, um, maybe when I was about in fourth grade. Then after that, she was a single mother for a long time. And then she eventually got remarried. Um, and then after that, you know, she retired at 54. She was the youngest person in our family to do that. So that was amazing that she was able to do that. Um, and then afterwards, you know, she just kind of lived her life on her terms until her demise. Um, she was, um, diagnosed with lung cancer in February, and she passed in June of last year. So it was a very short um, time from prognosis until her demise. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing more about your mother. Um, it does sound like she's had an amazing life. Um, would you mind talking a little bit more about how she was diagnosed, if you're willing to share, or like what are the weeks, how are the weeks leading up to her diagnosis like? Sure. So, I mean, during the time while I was in it, I would say that um, she started kind of feeling, you know, problems in her chest and things like that, that she attributed to um, heartburn. And so she was a very private person. So I'm an only child. So she really didn't like to burden me with the things that she was dealing with, even though I was in healthcare. Um, you know, I'm a doctor and I have a professional doctor. She always tell me, you're not a medical doctor. I'm like, okay, but I still know a couple of things, you know, um, but she was very private with her health. Um, so as I was going through it with her, um, it, it just happened really quickly from the time that, um, 
she was having like some problems in her chest. The next thing that we knew, we went to the doctor, I uh, went to the hospital, found out she had a lot of fluid on her chest and they pulled out maybe about two liters of liquid from her lungs. And it was at that point that we knew that things had gotten pretty bad. Um, but looking back after I read her medical records, I saw that this was something that was kind of progressing for a really long time. And she never actually got um, a lung cancer screening. Her doctor at the time had even prescribed her with smoking cessation medicine. But even knowing that part, lung cancer screening still wasn't a part of that um, of her of her treatment so that's something that was overlooked wow well thank you for sharing and it's something that the storyline is you know very similar to i think what a lot of what we've heard from a lot of patients who've been on here as well as caregivers that lung cancer was never on their radar never on the family's radar or the doctor's radar and it was like only after multiple other tests were performed um was it even you know, was lung cancer even considered? So and I think that's that's something that contributes to lung cancer being not diagnosed typically at later stages of disease. And so that's why, um, especially our organization, we really try to push for lung cancer screening and early detection of lung cancer, because when lung cancer is caught early in stage one, stage two, the prognosis is really very good. And especially with recent developments um, in treatments with targeted therapies, et cetera, there's, there's a lot of hope for, for patients diagnosed with lung cancer. And if we can just catch it early, then um, outcomes are, are really very good. So yeah, our, um, our next question was, um, if, would you be willing to share a little bit more about her diagnosis, like the type of lung cancer she had, the stage or, or grade, just to give our listeners some background? Yeah, absolutely. So she was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Um, well, I wouldn't, I don't know if you would actually say that that's what it was. She wasn't, um, it came so quickly that they never got to the point of actually diagnosing her. So usually, you know, if you have the symptoms, you know, they have you to take the scans and things like that, and then they give you a grade. But the way that she, her health just went so quickly, she never even got the chance to be diagnosed. Um, but upon review of her medical records, again, like I was saying, there were multiple times when she should have been referred over to get things looked at. For instance, um, she had an x-ray of her chest at one point, like years ago, and there was a small portion in her lungs where there was a little bit of scar tissue. And additional work was never done to see well, what, why is that scar tissue there? Maybe let's take a look at that a little bit more. So there were multiple times and they just never paid attention to it. And my mother wasn't aware enough to ask those types of questions. And because she didn't include me in her care so much, I wasn't able to, you know, help her with that. And so again, working off what Priyanka said as well, and what you said earlier that your mother never got screened and there was some um, there's some lack of knowledge from physicians and then um, information and advice given to your mother. Um, what do you think can be done to better educate health professionals on the use of screening? Because obviously in this circumstance, like no, no physician ever told your mother that screening may be an option. Right. So one of the great things about being a health information management professional and working alongside um, electronic health records and EHR, such as EPIC, um, one of the things that I know for certain is that we have clinical decision support systems. And oftentimes there are flags that are raised if certain information is entered into the computer system. So say, for instance, that um, you're a physician and you're trying to prescribe them some medication and that medication interacts with another medication, then there is something that alerts you, hey, don't give them this medication because X, Y, and Z. Same thing when it comes to like health screenings. Um, so they did actually mention when I looked at her record um, and I looked at the patient information that they give after um, a visit, they actually did talk about lung cancer screening. They talked about it within that, but they just never talked to her in person about that. So I think that um, more care should be given to those alert systems um, that are in place. They're there for a reason. I believe if um, there was an alert on her file that say, hey, this person is due for a lung cancer screening and they actually paid attention to it as opposed to just ignoring it. I think that that would have been something that would have 
definitely changed the game. So for instance, if it's time for her to get, you know, her annual women's check, they will say, hey, it's time for you to, you know, get your annual women's check. Would you like to get that scheduled? However, the same care was not given to lung cancer screening, knowing that she was a smoker and that she was on cessation medicine. So it was just an oversight all around. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And the I think electronic medical records can be really utilized in this setting because oftentimes smoking history is captured um, in EHRs and we obviously have age. And the for anyone who might not be familiar, lung cancer screening is currently recommended for individuals who are between the ages of 50 to 80 years and who have a 20 pack year smoking history and either currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. And all of this information definitely can be gleaned from um, an EHR. And I, there has been actually a study where that this has been implemented, where there what there is like a there was a banner that kind of popped up when an, when a patient was eligible for lung cancer screening, and the study reported that you know it it did um help increase the number of lung cancers that were caught at earlier stages, and so it, I think definitely trying to implement this um on a wide wide scale could be helpful, but I think one one limitation that we've and like pushback that we've we've gotten is that off sometimes the even the smoking history information reported on EHRs are not accurate or not up to date. And so that's, I think, one thing to to consider, because for um, a lot of people might not be smoking the same amount um, throughout their entire lifetime. So maybe at one point in their life, they're smoking um, half a pack of cigarettes a day, but maybe now they're smoking a quarter pack of cigarettes a day. And so it's sometimes not always updated and it maybe not the average of what that um, patient is smoking. So I think that that's the one nuance to kind of having the um, utilizing EHRs and those like alerts that you said, but otherwise yeah, I think absolutely. it's okay. absolutely. And then also another thing to take into consideration is that even if um, patients are eligible to get those lung cancer screenings, there's not a 100% um, assurance that insurance will even cover that. So I think that it should also go to uh, encouraging insurances to approve for those screenings to be done, because I know that those tests are, they tend to be very expensive. Um, so I don't know how a lot of insurances are when it comes to prior authorizations to get those screenings done. Um, so I think that that's also something that we should push for as well. So you, you touched on this as well, but, um, do you have any advice for patients and in your case for their caregivers who haven't received a screening but feel like they should get one? Absolutely. You should definitely advocate. Um, advocate for yourself, um, being knowledgeable about um, those things. But I think that that's a, a tall ask to ask for people who are, you know, smokers, you know, because for I think that nine times out of 10 or maybe 10 times out of 10, when you smoke, if you are a smoker, you inherently know those risks that come with smoking. So I think that um, maybe if we're going to maybe include it on cigarette packaging or something like the Surgeon's General warning or something like that, like make sure that you get screened every two, three years or something like that. So maybe it comes from doing that as well. But um, for those that may be not be a smoker, but maybe having some of those signs of lung cancer, maybe just advocate to see if there's something they can do to get like an x-ray or something just to check and make sure that everything is on the up and up. Yeah, absolutely. And I just wanted to add um, for individuals who might be feeling some of the symptoms of lung cancer, like chest pain or shortness of breath, um, a persistent cough, um, usually at that stage, um, physicians will do additional workup and maybe some more rigorous testing. Um, lung cancer screening is oftentimes for individuals who don't have symptoms of lung cancer, but, but may still be at high risk for, you know, a heavy smoking history. So for, if there's anyone listening, um, that is feeling maybe some sim symptoms that might, might align with lung cancer, definitely talk to your physician and, and the testing might look a little, little bit different. It might be, and it might be different from a, a low dose CT scan, which is usually what is recommended. Right. So once that diagnosis came down and your mother informed you, what were some of the responsibilities that you assumed as a caretaker? And, you know, what were some of the difficulties that you faced? Because obviously nobody can really prepare for that diagnosis or having to care for someone like that. You know? Yeah, um, it was something I was completely taken aback by. Um, it wasn't something that I was, you know, of course, planning to have to do. 
um, at the time I was working and, you know, I was doing full-time things with the business and I just kind of had to stop everything to make sure that I was there for her. So um, I took her to doctor's appointments when I could. There weren't many doctor's appointments that I could take her to um, because, again, it came so quickly, but I just had to be there every day. So while she was in the um, intensive care unit, while she was at the hospital, I was there every day. Um, one of the things that I had to do, though, is I had to take time away to replenish myself um, because sometimes you feel like, you know, you have nothing left to give because outside of being her daughter and being her caregiver, I was also a mother, a wife, I have three kids. So I'm still juggling my own personal responsibilities in addition to making sure that she's being taken care of as well. But I really had to take time away and not feel guilty for pouring back into myself. So that looked like, you know, going to get a facial or maybe taking myself out to eat, doing those things so that I could still have something left to give. So um, that was something I had to learn really early on. I felt guilty about it, but it's something that I really needed so that I still had something to give to both my family and to my mother. Yeah, I understand that's a really big change for both your mother, for your mother, you and your family as well. And I was wondering, what are some of the things that you learned specifically about your mother while being her caretaker during that time? Oh, my goodness. I learned how how much faith that she had. Um, she had a lot, a lot of faith. Um, one of the most poignant pictures I have is of her the day before she went in. Um, she was intubated. Um, and she was smiling. And one of the things that she always said, well, it wasn't, it's not about what you go through, but it's about how you go through it. So during the entire time while she was in the hospital, she was smiling. People were coming by to visit her. She had a smile on her face. She was laughing. You cannot really tell that there was something wrong with her outside of, you know, when her, um, her energy level started to deplete and things like that. You can kind of see when her energy kind of depleted a little bit, but I learned how resilient she was. She did not give up at any point in time and she still held strong to her faith. Um, and so I think that for a moment uh, growing up, I kind of questioned how strong her faith really was. But it was at the time when she was about to lose everything and she was still holding on to that. So that's something that's that's helped me also. Wow, that that's really inspiring. I, I think um, just how you view situ the situation can make a make a big difference. It's um, we've heard from a lot of patients that when they're diagnosed with lung cancer, the stats are not, you know, are not always um, super promising or super hopeful, but you know, recently with a lot of the research and treatments, things are um, are looking very hopeful for lung cancer patients. But, you know, several years ago, it was maybe not the same case. And so it's it's easy, I think, to to start to just worry and um, and with all the uncertainty that might come with the future. But uh, so just really inspiring to hear that even even through all of that, your your mother was able to you know keep smiling, keep moving. So that's awesome. Yeah. And, and oh, can I ask, did that sir did her joy, did her energy rub off on you, rub off on all the providers around her? Do you think it was like, you know, contagious and really helped absolutely. to absolutely? Yes, it absolutely was. After her passing, there was one physician, I forgot which which background he was in. Um, I forgot which one it was. I think it might have been um infection, because she had an infection in her back. Um, but he wrote me a letter. And he called me after she passed and he talked about how he, she was one of her, his favorite patients because she was so positive and she was always laughing. And uh, several of the providers that took care of her said the same thing. Um, and so, yeah, she just kept that, you know, all the way around. Now, I will say that there was one provider who we dealt with who was very tone deaf that, um, that we dealt with that wasn't very, um, like he didn't read the room too much. Um, but after that mishap where he was kind of just um, just spewing things like very matter of fact, he wasn't hopeful at all. He was like, oh, no, she's not a candidate for this. There's nothing that she can do. At that point, that's when I wanted to protect her peace because of the positivity that she had. And I made sure that that doctor was no longer allowed in her room. Uh, we also had um, the hospice nurse. I forgot what her name was. Um, but we also had someone who comes by like the, the death angel, they call her. 
I also wanted to make sure that she wasn't back into the room. And it's not because I didn't appreciate her foresight and what she was speaking about. It's just that I wanted to make sure that my mom kept that positivity as much as she could. And plus, even though things look dire, I did not want what she had to say to be the reason why my mom gave up. So that was also something I wanted to do is just protect her positivity and her peace. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what advice would you give to anyone who might have a loved one who is diagnosed with lung cancer or really any type of cancer? Um, just to do your research, even though the doctors may say one thing, there is nothing wrong with doing your own research and asking those tough questions. Um, if you learn about treatment options, talk about those treatment options. So for instance, I actually spoke with my mom's doctor and, um, you know, they, she told me about the treatment options that they had. I spoke with him one-on-one and I was like, okay, well, what are the options that you went through to discover that this is the only option that's available? Have you tried X, Y, and Z? Have you tried this? Have you tried that? Would she be a good candidate for this X, Y, and Z type of thing? So it's okay to ask those questions. Um, it's okay to seek second opinions. It's okay to, um, you know, just do your own research and, and not be afraid to advocate for yourself. It's, it's okay to do that. Yeah, I completely agree with you about advocating for yourself and doing the re your own research. And I had another question. If you're willing to share more, how did your life change after the passing of your mother? Oh, man, that's a tough question. Um, as an only child, one thing that I will say is that when you're growing up, well, for me, I'll just speak from my own experience, but I know that a lot of people can relate to this. When you're growing up and when you become an adult, a lot of the decisions that you make are based off of, if I make this decision, will it make mom proud? If I make this decision, will it make dad proud? You know, what will they say if I do this? What will they say if I do that? And one of the things that I learned after she passed is that there was no one else left to impress. Um, so it just came to the point of now I could live for myself. My dad is still around, but we have a different type of relationship. But it was my mother who I was really looking to do things for because I really sought her approval. And so now it's at a point where there's nobody else to answer to. So it's almost like there is this the silver lining of being free to do whatever I want to do and that there is nobody who can say anything. But then it's also of trying to figure out what now. So um, that's something I still struggle with. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be a part of being able to support this initiative, because I think it's so important and it's something that she would want me to do. One of the things that she talked about with her story was that she, she knew that her story would impact others. She just didn't know how. And so I try to carry that legacy forward. Um, but I would definitely say just being able to make those decisions on your own and figuring out who you are without having, you know, your parents or having to someone to, to answer to. So now it's like, it's all on you to kind of figure out what to do next. Thank you for sharing that with us. And it's amazing that your mom kind of knew that like her story would be important to other people. And thank you so much for sharing that with us and how your life has changed. Um, from your expertise working with, um, and professionals, how can we educate communities about lung cancer screening? Um, again, I think it's more so about, you know, what these, what the cover, what the government can do to um, expand on that access. Um, that's a really tough question. Um, getting more information out there again, because like I said, when you when you smoke or as a smoker, you inherently know the risks that come with that. And so I think that it's really up to healthcare professionals who know that their patients are smokers, whether or not they're truthful about the amount that they smoke or not, that they understand that this is something that you need to do. You need to make sure that you have your, your cancer screenings as much as possible. Even if they say that they only smoke one cigarette a day, just like you'll have some people, I used to work at um, a, a, um, 
a county hospital. And, you know, of course, sometimes when you have county hospitals, you have a lot of people who are on drugs that come in, they don't tell you that they're doing drugs and things like that, because they don't want that stigma associated with the type of care that they're given. So sometimes you might have patients that come in that aren't being truthful about the amount of times that they smoke, or, you know, maybe they say that they're not smoking at all because they don't want to have additional testing done. I still think that providers should make sure that they are aware uh, of lung cancer and, um, you know, of those screening things. I think that's something that should be pushed as well. Um, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing because when you go to the doctor, I think that they have a um, an obligation to let you know about the types of screenings that are available to you, regardless of not if you meet the criteria or not, but just kind of putting things out there. Yeah, well, that was that was some really great insight. And um, we admire everything that you're doing, you know, going through your bio you're involved in a lot. So we were just wondering, can you describe, you know, some of the things that you're currently doing within the community, some initiatives you're working on? Sure. So in addition to kind of being like a, I guess you could say like a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, someone that, you know, kind of piggybacks off some of the projects that you guys are working on. I was a part of a meeting not too long ago. Where I was kind of giving some feedback on some types of um, initiatives that can be taken care of with the medical record. Um, also, I'm a faculty member for SNHU, so I try to speak to my students as much as possible about how health information can be um, used to improve outcomes. Those are some of the initiatives I do. It's more of the groundwork type things. Um, and also just talking to family and friends about it as much as possible. You know, I, if I'm on the street um, and I happen to see someone smoking or something, I may or may not decide to say something like, hey, you know, be careful with that, you know. Uh, so that's type of, kind of the work that I do. And whatever I kind of uh, see that comes my way that I feel that um, would be the best use of my skill set and my expertise, um, I kind of go towards that. Um, it's really taken a while to get out of the morning grief stage because um, after having that realization, it kind of takes a while to get back to the real world. So now I'm at a point where I'm just trying to figure out, okay, I know that all of this happened for a reason. How can I use what's been, what's happened to me to help and impact and change others' lives? So that's where I'm at right now. So I'm just trying to see uh, where I'm needed and go in there. So um, you mentioned that you were a professor and as a current undergraduate student, I was just wondering, um, <clears throat> have these experiences changed at all how you approach teaching or interacting with students? Like, has this had any impact on your career or how you approach being a professor? Um, one thing I will say is that since I'm already a healthcare or health information management professional anyway, I think that my experiences being able to see things from the patient standpoint has changed things because oftentimes I'm behind the computer. So that experience let me know what patients were dealing with on the front end. So I think that I kind of have more empathy in that regard, seeing how um, healthcare is is you know, how patients are treated on the front end of things, but it also gave me more of an appreciation of, uh, of the lack of things that caregivers actually have as far as having access to information, being able to speak to the different doctors and things like that. Another thing that, I've, um, that I forgot to mention is that I really learned through my own experience about the importance of estate planning. So I'm really big on estate planning as well. Um, my mom, you know, we went through the whole spiel of everything from top to bottom um, before she passed. And we made sure that everything was done um, before that she passed away. So that's something I encourage other people to do as well. And anytime I have an opportunity to talk about estate planning, I'm always talking about it. I think that's another part of healthcare that we don't talk about um, when it comes to advanced directives. What do you want to happen in the event that you are, you know, that you can't make those decisions on your own? Because that was a decision that I had to make um, when they took her off the, the intubation. Um, there was a possibility that she wouldn't come out alive. So they wanted to know if I wanted to do any resuscitation type things on her. So I had to make that decision. But her and I both had that discussion before she got got to that point where we knew, okay, if this happens, then I don't want to be a vegetable, go ahead and let me go. But I think that those are important conversations that we have to have as well. And this is as important as anything else when it comes to healthcare. Yeah, thank you so much for making the effort to really educate all the people, the students, your community members, and all family around you about lung cancer and lung cancer screening. 
and also for speaking with us here um, about your efforts and your story. And we were wondering, how can listeners connect with you to learn more about your story or more about what you do? Absolutely. So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm under Dr. S.K. Moreland, or you can send me an email at info at himconcierge.com. And those are the two best ways to contact me. I love to talk to people. So anytime you reach out, I'll be there. All right. Well, it's truly been a pleasure and an honor to speak with you today, Dr. Moreland, and learn from the wealth of knowledge and experience that you have in the area of health education and cancer advocacy. And as we said, we appreciate all the work that you're doing and the perspective that you brought to our podcast. Um, thank you to all our listeners for joining us on this podcast episode. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. And please keep an eye out for any of our upcoming podcasts or events, which you can find on our website, www.lc.org. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.